Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised. Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers. Go to Galilee. There they will see me. Hear the bells ringing, they're singing that we can be born again. Hear the bells ringing, they're singing Christ is risen from the dead. Angel upon the tombstone said he is risen, just as he said. Quickly now go tell his disciples that Jesus Christ is no longer dead. Joy to the world, he is risen. Hallelujah, he is risen. Hallelujah, he is risen. bells ringing, they're singing that we can be born again. Hear the bells ringing, they're singing Christ is risen from the dead. The angel upon the tombstone said he is risen just as he said. Quickly now go tell his disciples that Jesus Christ is no longer dead. Joy to the world, he is risen. Hallelujah, he is risen. Hallelujah, he is risen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Joy to the world, he is risen. Hallelujah. He's risen, hallelujah, he's risen, hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Good morning, Harbor of Harbor of Joy friends and those of you that uh, are, who knows, from where you're listening in on, just want you to know that this is an Easter that you will never forget. Uh, right here in Iowa, Milford, Iowa, where we're kind of uh, not broadcasting, but we're on Zoom. Just want you to know that it is snowing and blowing and uh, reminds me of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, where it says, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. God is reminding us today on this Easter morning that uh, our sins are forgiven through what Christ has done for us as, he's, as we celebrate his resurrection on this Easter Sunday. Just want to uh, remind you that uh, we are having communion virtual communion today. I hope this is uh, the first and probably the last. <laughs> I don't know, but we're going to do that today as we celebrate Easter. And also remind the uh, church council, those of you that serve on the Harbor of Joy Church Council, that we will uh, be on Zoom uh, Tuesday night at seven o'clock. And if you've got any questions on how to get on Zoom, I just ask you to call Dina or Denny Struck, and they'll tell you how to get there and get on. So we'll do that as a, something a little different for us this coming uh, coming week. Also to remind you that uh, our annual business meeting, which usually takes place on the last Sunday of April, we will just reschedule that to when we can get together and meet together. Um, hopefully we can do that in May, but we'll, we'll have to find out if that will be the case or not. But that is um, what is the plan. So. Um, 
just want to also remind the Harbor of Joy family that uh, there are April birthdays, and I just know of only one, and that is uh, Sharon Holman. She's got hers tomorrow, I believe. But there's a number of other people at Harbor Joy that uh, have birthdays this month, and we just wish you a, a great birthday because it's going to be really great because you can't go anywhere. You just got to stay home. <laughs> so uh, make your own birthday or call somebody up that you know that likes to bake, maybe they'll drop off a birthday cake for you. But uh, I always can give you a phone call to wish you a happy birthday. So happy birthday from Harbor of Joy, from, from me to all of us here, which aren't very many. Uh, we are glad that you can celebrate another birthday. That's really all the announcements that I have here this morning. And uh, you know, as we continue on with this, kind of uh, voluntarily staying at home because of the Corona virus. I can't help but to think of, uh, you know, there's farmers out there that are really impacted that we sometimes we forget about. Uh, the milk producers, you know, there's a lot of them just dumping milk because schools are closed. And you've got uh, ranchers that grow beef, that have beef, that uh, the restaurants are closed. So there's not really a, a market for for beef and this has affected cattle prices. And we also think of bacon. You know, here in Iowa, there's all kinds of bacon, but all the hotels and, and uh, motels are, are closed. And so there's no bacon for, for those outlets as well. So, I mean, it, it's really affecting a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And we just want to pray for our president and those in leadership as far as deciding what to do during this time of uncertainty and something we've never ever had to, to face before. We're grateful for all of the healthcare workers that are out there uh, day by day and going to the hospitals and to the healthcare centers that uh, take care of, of our elderly. And uh, our prayers are, are with you, continue to give you strength each and every day, as well as the doctors and the nurses that are so faithfully serving and uh, we just uh, want you to know that we are pulling for you. And uh, we're all like you. We just don't know what's going to take place. But we know that God is still in control. And that's the main thing that we never forget, that God knows what's going on all the time. And we are grateful for, for that. So there's going to be another song right now that Bob Floss is going to play. Uh, Easter song called Jesus Christ is Risen Today. Christ is risen today. Hallelujah. Our triumphant holy day. Hallelujah. Who did once upon the cross? Hallelujah. Suffer to redeem our loss. Hymns of praise and let us sing Hallelujah Unto Christ our heavenly King Hallelujah Who endured the cross and grave Oh, hallelujah, sinners to redeem and save. Oh, hallelujah. Sing we to our God above, hallelujah. Praise eternal as his love. Hallelujah. Praise him, all ye heavenly hosts. Hallelujah. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Hallelujah.
Thank you, Bob. Great job, as always. For the message today, I'm going to do something a little different as far as an Easter message. I'm going to, we're going to look at Lazarus being called back from the dead by Jesus, and then also then comparing some of those things that happened with Lazarus to the morning that Jesus rose from the dead in, in, the, uh, in the garden as well. So uh, it's going to be a little bit different than, than normal, but at the same time, I believe that the message of this resurrection will come across uh, for you as well. So I want to read from John chapter 11, verses 38 through 45 today just to set the stage. It says, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I, I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Then he said to this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, put their faith in him. I kind of lost my screen here. I don't know what's there. I'm okay. I'm back. <laughs> Just want to pray before I give the message here this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Easter that we can come gather together, even though we're we're not together here at the church, but in the homes. We know, Lord, that with the weather outside, there's probably not many that would want to venture out anyway. So this is kind of a blessing that we didn't foresee coming at all, just like with the coronavirus. But we know, Lord, that you are in control and that you are with us today as we celebrate Easter in a different way than normal, as many of us probably will not have families getting together. But there's always the, the phone. There's always these, these uh, devices you've given to us where we can do some FaceTime and uh, still be able to connect. I pray that, that today will be a day that we will not forget what you've done for us by rising again from the dead. And uh, be with those that are listening to this today, that they know that your presence is with them. The good news is still the good news today, regardless of where we're at. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I just want to begin by saying that Christianity, it stands or it falls on the resurrection. And that's why the resurrection is so important to the Christian faith. If you remove or if you try to disprove the resurrection, even if you could disprove it, well, guess what? Christianity would not exist if you could disprove the resurrection. There have been many who have tried and uh, they've come to the same conclusion as that it's real. Jesus did rise again from the dead. You go to any other leader uh, that, that has been very influential in throughout history, they'll take you to their grave. You go to Lenin, you go to, uh, to Buddha, you go to um, uh, Mohammed, you're going to find there is a, a grave that is there. But if you go to the grave where Jesus was buried, you'll find that the tomb is empty. And that's what really makes Christianity different from all other religions in the world. And I'm so thankful for that today because I needed to know that Jesus was alive at one time in my life too. And I just wonder, is it just a, a myth? Is it just a story? 
or what. But uh, those who've tried to disprove the resurrection, many of them have come to faith and have come to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and, in, and as their Savior as well. So today, like I said, I want to spend a little time uh, when Jesus called Lazarus out of the grave and to uh, look at the time when Jesus rose from the dead. The differences are, are this. The first one is that Jesus was there and he spoke Lazarus's name to come out of the grave. The other difference is that no one was there to speak the name of Jesus to come out of his tomb, out of his grave. He did what he said he was going to do as he spoke to his disciples on at least three different occasions during his ministry. He told them that he would rise again after three days. They probably didn't understand it at the time, but they sure are going to understand it here this morning on the resurrection day for sure. So from the very beginning, when Jesus first heard that Lazarus was sick, he said the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. That's very important to always remember that that's what Jesus said when he first heard that Lazarus was sick. So the messenger who came with the news of telling Jesus that Lazarus was sick, I'm sure he heard what Jesus said, and he went back to Martha and Mary and told them that uh, this is going to be something that God is going to be glorified through it. And we know that Jesus stayed where he was at for two extra days. And when he comes to Bethany, where Lazarus, his hometown, and where Martha and Mary lived, that we find that uh, it's four days later, and all hope of Lazarus ever being healed or coming back to life, they're all gone. Lazarus is gone, but Jesus is there. Again, Jesus is deeply moved when he approaches Lazarus's grave. The cemetery is the final place where sin and sickness produce death. It's that piece of ground that bears the name, the date of birth and the date of death on a granite marker or on a headstone. The person in the grave is gone, but there are memories that go with the name and the markers that are seen before your feet or in your presence. You can still hear the voice and the laughter of the person who has been buried there. If it be your father, if it be your mom, if it be your husband, if it be your wife, or one of your children, or just some relative. Their presence is gone, but, but yet they're still remembered in so many different ways. In our text here today, Lazarus, Jesus comes out and just says right away, makes it plain and clear to his disciples that Lazarus is dead. Not the thing that you ever want to hear uh, from, from anyone or even on the telephone. But the tomb that is described here for Lazarus is that it was a cave with a stone that was laid across the entrance. The tomb where Jesus was buried it was a brand new tomb. It was hewn out of the rock. No person in that, no person had ever been in that grave. And uh, where am I at here? <laughs> Lost my place here. But we do find, remember that the, there's a huge stone that has been rolled in front of the entrance of Jesus's grave. And it was a place where uh, the, the women who went there early on Easter morning that they were concerned about, like, who's going to move, remove the stone because they wanted to anoint the body of Jesus as they went there. Well, one of the things, even though Jesus said, take away the stone, that there were people present. There were other Jews that were there that could do just that. They could remove the stone, and they did. 
when we think of Jesus, we find that the chief priests and the Pharisees, they went to Pilate requesting that the stone be rolled uh, to be secured. They want to make sure that no one could come and, and take the body because they know that the body would be missing, that a lot of people would, would use that as a way of saying that that, that guy said that he was going to uh, uh, come alive and, and disappear type of thing, or, or people seem alive and there'll be a bigger mess than what they have now. So Pilate told them to secure the tomb by putting the Roman seal on the stone and then also to post a guard. You find that in Matthew 27, uh, 65 through 66. So what you have is Pilate kind of calling up like seal team six. These were Roman, so, Roman soldiers that really knew how to guard and they knew that their lives were on the line that if anyone would break that seal or take the body, that it meant it was their lives at stake. They would die for this if somebody would come and remove the body. We find that the women, when they got there, the stone was already moved away. How did that happen? Well, the scriptures tell us that, you know, there was an earthquake. There was also angels that were seen at the tomb. So it could be done in a couple of different ways. Either the earthquake moved it or the angels came. But there's no, there's no sightings of the guards that were posted there, uh, what we find in Mark 16, uh, verse 4. So back to Lazarus. When Jesus said to take away the stone, we find it is Martha, the sister of Lazarus, who speaks up. And she's the one that has lots of faith before this. She said, Lord, if you only would have been here, my brother would still be alive. Well, Martha speaks up and she says this, but Lord, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in the grave for four days. Now, Jesus' purpose is for everyone to see the glory of God. And, and he says here that he prays that all who see what is about to happen will believe that God sent Jesus. After Jesus had prayed, he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. It is interesting that he specifically says Lazarus. There are some theologians who said that if he wouldn't, if he just said, come out, it probably would have been everybody out of the cemetery would have came alive. Interesting thought. But he specifically shouts out, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man, Lazarus, came out. Well, you talk about a weird place and a, see something just you've never seen before in your life. To see someone you know that has been dead for four days come out of that cave, out of that tomb. And as he comes out, it says that his hands and his feet were wrapped with strips of linen. And there was some cloth around his face. And there was some preparations for burial that they would do for people. Jesus says, take off the grave clothes and let him go. What a time that had to have been, to have been there and seen that. When we look at what took place at Jesus' tomb, at his grave, it says that his body was prepared by Joseph of Artemia and by Nicodemus. And both of these guys were on the Sanhedrin, which is a very uh, important group of men. There's like our Supreme Court. And they would also have been there to uh, hear the discussions that were going on among the Sanhedrin of trying to get rid of Jesus. They wanted, they, they were really the group of people along with the high priest Caiaphas and uh, I think his father-in-law, Annas, that really wanted to see Jesus killed. And we know that Joseph and Nicodemus, they had strips of cloth and they had uh, body spices, and they wrapped the body of Jesus in 75 pounds of uh, preparing his body, of a mixture of myrrh and aloes. And so Jesus' body would, would be something like a cocoon as he was placed in his, in his tomb. 
we find at Jesus' tomb, the grave closed and the angels were there. But Jesus himself, his body was missing. It was gone. Lazarus was there and alive. And it says that many of the Jews who came to visit Mary and Martha, they had seen what Jesus did and they put their faith in him. Now that was probably the biggest things that the religious leaders did not want to hear is that many came to faith because of what they saw of Jesus bringing Lazarus back to life. It says later on in chapter 12 of John that a dinner was given in Jesus' honor and a large crowd of the Jews came to see Jesus and the one whom he had raised from the dead. So this, the word went out like a wildfire and people came not just to see Jesus, but they really wanted to see Lazarus as well. What's really interesting is that nothing is said that Lazarus was speaking, which I'm sure he did. People were asking him questions, but nothing is recorded in scripture of what Lazarus said and kind of think of like, well, what was the afterlife like? What would he say of, of uh, what he had saw or where he had been type of a thing that people would be asking questions like we all would. But scripture does not tell us anything of any kind of a conversation that was had with Lazarus. And even after this, after this account, we hear nothing more about the man Lazarus, but we do know this is that he had to die again. I don't know about you, but I don't like the thought of that. Dying once is enough. But then to come back and you have to die all over again is not really my cup of tea. I don't know about you. So after the resurrection, we find that we hear nothing about Lazarus. He doesn't talk. But we do hear that Jesus did speak. He, he speaks just like you're listening to me. He was there in person. I mean, I'm not there in person, I'm on a screen. But Jesus spoke to Mary Magdalene at the tomb. And not only her, but he stood then among his disciples. The disciples were in a room, the doors were locked, the windows were locked, there's no way anyone could get in. And all of a sudden they find that Jesus is standing there in the midst of them. After the resurrection, our bodies are different. It's in a glorified state. You can walk through walls. You can walk through doors. It's just a, kind of an amazing thing that we have no idea what that's going to be like. But there's Jesus with his disciples in this locked room, and he speaks to them. And he says to them, peace be with you. Now, Thomas was not there. One of the disciples was not there. But when he did show up, the rest of the disciples, and now these would be his friends, his close friends as well for three years, uh, following Jesus, and he did not even believe them that they saw Jesus alive. And so Thomas says this, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And this is where Thomas gets that, that infamous uh, nickname, Doubting Thomas. But then Jesus did come a second time when Thomas was there with the disciples. And Jesus told Thomas, touch my hand. You know, put your hand in, in the side where the spear had pierced my side. And do you know what Thomas's response was? His response was this, my Lord and my God. He didn't doubt anymore. Jesus showed himself after the resurrection. Everybody knew he had died. Thomas now understands and has seen him alive. The purpose of John's gospel is found in chapter 20 of John, verse 31. It says this, that these are written, that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That is the whole purpose of John's gospel for anyone who reads it, is that if you're not a believer in Christ, 
that he wants you to become a believer and to know that Jesus is the Lord and the Savior that he said he, that he was and is. It is very interesting that in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every one of them talks about his crucifixion and his resurrection. And there's a lot of different details that each of them bring out that one does not do all of them. You kind of put them all together and you go like, wow, there is a lot going on here. And God made sure that we would hear the whole story or the full story of at least the important things that we need to hear as uh, we read the Gospel of John. And so John wants doubters like Thomas to become believers. Maybe that sounds like you today. Maybe you can say like, well, I can relate to that. I never really thought this was a real thing anyway. Today you say differently that I know he lives. Without the resurrection, there would be no good news. There would be no hope for us. Without the resurrection, there would be no message for us to go and tell. Without the, resurrec without the resurrection, there would be no churches. So you ever thought of that, that one of the proofs that Christianity lives, that Jesus Christ came back from the dead, like he said he would. There are churches, no matter where you go, pretty much today. There are countries that want to keep them out, but they're still underground churches that still meet and will be today rejoicing and praising the Lord for coming back from the dead, his resurrection day. Without the resurrection, there would be no changed lives. So the resurrection is, it is mind-blowing. Think of your life, of what God has done for you because of today, Easter that we celebrate, the Resurrection Day. That is true. He lives, and he is my Savior. It's just like Jesus told Martha in Matthew 11, 25 to 26, and you've heard this verse many times as well where Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. That's a wonderful verse. I hope you find that a special verse for you and that as Jesus said to Martha, do you believe this? that your, your answer and your response will be the same as Martha's. She said, yes, I do believe this. So right now, today, as we celebrate Easter together, the same question is, is directed towards you. And it's either answered with a yes or a no. You can't put a maybe. Because a maybe is like saying, I don't know. But do you believe that Jesus is a resurrected Savior and Lord that he's claimed to be? Remember, the body was, was gone. We have many witnesses who attested they saw him over 40 days before he ascended into heaven. And so he's in a lot of different, different situations and circumstances with people that either lifted their faith, which it had to have done that because the good news spread throughout the whole world, and continues to do so today. Without the resurrection, there'd be no missionaries, no reason for missionaries to go. There'd be no reason for there to be churches. There'd be no reason for there to be pastors. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have anything to say. It wouldn't be for the resurrection. So may the Lord bless you this Easter Sunday. And uh, you think about a lot of the things that God has done for you because he loves you and he cares about you. And he'll take you just the way you are. You don't have to change anything today. Just say, Lord, I'm a, I'm a sinner and I need you in my life. Help me to live for you. 
from this day forward. You'd be surprised what that prayer will do and can do for you. So have a happy Easter and uh, enjoy your time with your family or with those that you are with. Amen. Before we receive communion, I'd like for us to say the Apostles' Creed together. One of the things you'll notice is that uh, there's no screen for you to read <laughs> where you can uh, say it. You might have to go like, oh boy, I hope I can remember the words here, but I'm going to read it because oftentimes I can forget as well. But the Apostles' Creed tells us what we believe and what's important to believe as Christians today and around the world. It says this, and you can say it out loud with me if you'd like. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, yoo-hoo, third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The words of institution for our communion goes like this. In the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he said to his disciples, this is my blood. Drink all of it in remembrance of me. After that, he took the bread. I got some authentic unleavened bread here. And he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And we're to do this until he comes again. So I'm just going to ask you that if you have prepared yourself to have your own elements in front of you that uh, we'll just take, we'll take them together. So I mean, when I take mine, you can take yours and we'll just kind of do it that way. Okay. So I'm saying this, this is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. Hear the good news. Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who is now giving you his holy body and blood, through which he has made full satisfaction for all your sins. May he strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto everlasting life.
let us pray the Lord's Prayer together before Bob comes and sings our final song today. And after his song, I will give the benediction. You can say it along with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go ahead, Bob. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just in time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to a call. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives with him. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. God earth is loving, so good and kind. He lives in him, Christ Jesus lives today. Walks with me and walks with me along my narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Here, me. Thank you, Bob. Just want I'm going to give the benediction, but I just want you to know that uh, if you'd like to unmute your device that you have following the service here today for a little bit of fellowship time or look at each other and just able, able to say hi, we'll offer that if you want to just hold on uh, after the benediction here today. And here's, here's the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Go and serve the Lord.